I'm going to talk really fast, and some of these ideas um, are going to be really new, and some of them are you're already going to know about it. So I might uh, breeze over some of the nutrition stuff, since most of you are probably more familiar with the nutritional importance of meat to our diet, but less familiar with some of the um, ecological arguments I'm going to be making. Um, so I'll just get started, and I should let you know, too, I'm... Um, well, I'll just give you, I'll start with my disclosure. So I eat animals and plants. I live on a farm that raises animals and plants. Um, I sell books promoting the eating of animals and plants. I believe that humans are omnivores and um, Epic paid for my travel expenses to come here. So I'm a shell for Epic. <laughs> Thank you, Epic. Um, so, uh, Anyone see the latest that Germany wants to um, propose a meat tax? Okay, it's really, really hot over in, in Europe right now in particular, much more so than in the US, I think. Um, I've, I've done some filming over there. I was just in Brussels not too long ago. Um, and this all kind of is coming uh, generally from uh, Sweden, actually. And Italy's very mad about this. Spain and France are very mad about this. Um, Belgium is mixed. Um, Norway is very mad. <laughs> uh, anyhow, we're, so we're being told that um, meat is this trifecta of evil. So um, when we went through the, the margarine versus butter uh, epic, uh, you know, that was just one thing. It was just based on health. There was no environment or ethics in there. But now we've got not only is meat uh, bad for your health, but it's also um, bad for the environment. Um, unnecessary because humans can um, evolve beyond our primal barbaric nature of eating animals um, and it's cleaner and more pure to be eating uh, a vegetarian diet um, and the other side is very well funded and well organized and we frankly are not um, and uh, are you guys mostly familiar with Eat Lancet this is uh, global dietary recommendations that came out of Sweden earlier in 2019. Um, no processed meat at all. This is a global diet to save all of us from ourselves. Um, no processed meat at all. You can only eat less than half an ounce of red meat per day, which is about the size of a blueberry. Uh, less than one ounce of chicken per day. So you can have a, twice as much chicken as meat. So two blue blueberries worth of chicken, a quarter of an egg a day. Um, but you can have eight teaspoons of sugar per day, and the main fats are ultra-processed seed oils. So what's going on? Meat has become the scapegoat. Um, it's very, very convenient for the fossil fuel industry, for the coal industry, for the processed food industry. If we can pin all of our anxieties about our failing health and our warming planet on evil meat, which is so powerful, because it's bloody, it's primal, it represents so many things to our culture, um, wealth, uh, masculinity, right? Um, it's, it's unfairly absorbing all of our stress and has become this, uh, this pharmacos, this scapegoat. So what we're being told, meat taxes, and I had this on way before the Germany thing because this has been floated around a for a while. This is from the Physicians Committee for responsible medicine, which is neither physicians nor responsible. Um, they tell you that you um, eggs may increase your risk of diabetes by 68%, which is not even doubling your risk. And may means associated, not directly causing. Um, so this is kind of what we're up against, and they're taking out billboards. We have no one in the, in the primal space just saying meat is healthy, right? Um, uh, with billboards, anyway. Uh, so, can a healthy, sustainable food system exist without animals? So this is the question that I've been raising. And the reason why I am calling the project Sacred Cow is that it's an idea, custom, or institution held especially unreasonably above criticism. So it's just assumed that meat is unhealthy. No one in my town eats red meat. They're educated, they're concerned about the environment, red meat is completely off the table, okay? Um, 
And it's quite a compelling case to say that we don't need animals. Meat is murder is a very simple thing, right? Um, but in order for me to unpack this, and Rob Wolf has um, my, my co-author and um, one of the main leaders in the film, um, has, has said that this is really a PhD dissertation to unpack all of this. So I have to teach you about you know, evolutionary frameworks. I have to teach you about food production, nutrient density, basically unteach you everything you've ever been taught um, throughout you know, school. That, um, that actually cattle are sacred and one of our best tools at mitigating climate change, one of the most nutrient dense foods that humans can be eating. And again, who wins when we vilify meat? It's these guys. Who's funding Eat Lancet? These guys. When we can vilify meat, when we can get meatless Mondays in New York City public schools, that takes the pressure off the processed food industry. So what's the worst part about school lunch? It's not the burger in the bun, right? Um, but if we can pin all of our stress on that burger and just swap it out with an ultra-processed veggie puck, then, which are twice as expensive as grass-fed beef, um, then big food wins. And who loses, in particular, is uh, people in developing countries. People where you can't just grow soy People don't own land. So most of the people in this world that are living in poverty are subsistence farmers who rely on livestock. If you think about it, they're mobile. You don't need to irrigate them. Uh, they can uh, forage a, a lot of time. And uh, Nestle's going door to door now um, trying to convince people. This is a, an image from a New York Times article about Brazil where they're going door to door trying to get people off breastfeeding and um, addicted to Nestle formula with dirty water. Um, but of course now the new thing is gonna be telling all these people that they should not be eating the most nutrient dense food, the, the, the best food that they have access to. So, and I'm particularly disturbed by what's gonna happen in the New York City public schools. So here's uh, the mayor of New York City uh, sitting down to a meatless Monday lunch. If you look closely at what he's eating, it's a grilled cheese sandwich and a bunch of beans. So this is, this is the more nutrient dense lunch. So 70% of the kids that go to school in New York City public schools are low income, 10% are homeless. Okay, this is a social justice issue um, and it's absolutely not okay. There's only been one study looking at meat versus less meat or no meat in children and it was done in Kenya, and it was a, a randomized control trial where they, they took um, malnourished kids, they supplemented one group with extra meat, one group with extra calories, one group with um, extra dairy, and one group you know, as the control, and the meat group, of course, performed better physically and academically. The next group was actually the uh, over-calorie group the dairy group of all three dietary interventions performed the worst. So dairy is not a decent substitute for meat. That's the only randomized control trial they've ever done on children. So there's no evidence at all that reducing meat in an already at-risk population will do anything. And there's also a study that I'll talk about in a little bit showing that if we eliminated all animals from the entire U.S. food system, greenhouse gas emissions would only go down 2.6 percent. So think about what reducing burgers one day a week in New York City public schools is gonna do, like this much, right? Um, in this study also, if we eliminated all meat, overall calorie consumption would go up, overall carb consumption would go up, and nutrient deficiencies would go up. So we have to think about the nutritional cost in addition to the environmental cost. Because uh, the environment's gonna be here long after we're all gone so we need to be thinking about how, what is the most optimal diet for humans and then how can we make that in a sustainable way? But unfortunately, what's driving right now is all of these environmental experts looking at you know, what aspect of our food system creates the least emissions in a very reductionist view, and then that's what we should be eating. So not looking at this from a, a you know, what do humans need to thrive perspective, it's how do we produce human feed? So, and I've actually even, in my book, looked into the environmental footprint of diabetes. 
So when you look at all the lancets, all the needles, the amputations, the time out of work, all the hospital stays, you know, the environmental footprint of sick population that's overweight and has diabetes is pretty intense. In addition to my frustration with the New York City Public School Meatless Monday campaign is the propaganda that they're allowed to put in the schools. With no citations, global livestock creates more greenhouse gas than the entire transportation sector. That's absolutely not true. Guess who funds Meatless Mondays? Beyond Burger. Okay, decrease your chance of getting diabetes by 15%, which statistically is insignificant, by eating more beans. I don't understand the mechanism there. There's no citation. Um, so they've got, if you go to the Meatless Mondays website, look at their resources. They've got table tents and posters. Every New York City public school kid will be seeing these from age kindergarten all the way to 12th grade that meat is unhealthy and bad for the environment. And these are at-risk kids that need that iron, that need that protein. So this is probably stuff that you already know. I'm gonna go through it a little more quickly. Vegetarians are not healthier than meat eaters. The studies looking at you know, a typical vegetarian versus a typical meat eater um, are largely not controlling for those confounding factors like lifestyle. Vegetarians are much more likely to do yoga and you know, take care of their bodies, and then you compare that to Joe Sixpack, and I don't mean Sixpack, uh, when they've adjusted for all confounding factors, when they've um, done studies looking at, for example, people that shop at health food stores, therefore adjusting for, you know, your, the typical lifestyle of someone who shops at a health food store, there is absolutely no difference in longevity at all between omnivores and vegetarians. The uh, WHO report that a lot of this anti-meat stuff is based on uh, showed that bacon was the same as cigarettes, or at least that's how the media and that's how um, the vegan propaganda films like to show it. But um, it's not really looking at uh, the actual risks. So when you consider that smoking increases your cancer of multiple increases your chance of cancer, of multiple different types of cancer, by anywhere from 15,000 to 30,000 percent. Eating five slices of bacon every single day for the whole rest of your life only increases your chance by 18 percent. So to put that in another perspective, our general risk of getting colon cancer is about 5 percent in the general public. If you ate five slices of bacon, every single day for the whole rest of your life, your chance would go up to 6%. So is it the same? You know, there's this one image I remember from watching one of these unnamed uh, vegan documentaries where they showed a mom feeding her kid cigarettes for breakfast, right? Um, and then all the studies uh, looking at red meat uh, and cancer are all associations. There's absolutely no direct link at all. Um, and um, observational studies suck. So uh, this, a lot of this comes from the Ansel Keys. Again, a lot of you already know this, but you know, saying eating saturated fat is correlated to more cholesterol, is correlated to heart disease, is the same as saying eating ice cream is correlated to warmer temperatures. And so if you don't want to die of a shark attack, don't eat ice cream. Or telephones in the home uh, result in more calls to the police, and so if you want to reduce your murder rate, just get rid of phones in the home. Okay, that's the same logic here. And then, of course, dietary recall. Everybody lies. So there's the nutritional research is not a great uh, science. People are much more likely to forget that they drink and smoke. They're going to remember maybe that they ate a burger last week, but they're going to forget the deep fried apple pie, the 72 ounce soda, and the large fries that they ate with it. And they're much more likely to remember how many times they went to the gym. Okay, so people, people are just not truthful at all in diet recall. Um, and so is it the burger or is it all these other factors or the combination of the hyperpalatable food that we get from the burger and the bun and all the condiments on it that it spark us to overeat. Is that the same as smoking? Okay, but aren't we eating way too much meat? No, 
we're not. So the average American eats about two ounces, a little less than two ounces of red meat per day, of beef per day. Um, and we're eating much less protein than we should be, in my opinion. And I've looked at, I've pretty much done a systematic review on my own, looking at protein requirements, where did they come from, uh, nitrogen balance studies, which are pretty flawed, um, not taking into account also the satiating benefits of protein and then you know other nutrients that you're getting from things like red meat so um, when you up someone's protein they're feeling full they're going to naturally decrease their overall caloric intake regardless if i change anything else in their diet so a lot of times when i get someone that um, in my clinical practice that uh, i can see is going to be a little difficult to work with i just jack up their protein very first appointment and then we start working on other things if they're not ready to jump right in. So um, this is looking at the AMDR, which is the um, uh, macronutrient distribution, distribution ratio, uh, recommending anywhere from 10 to 35% of protein. And I like at least 20%, if not more. Um, and there's really good evidence to anyone over 40, anyone stressed, uh, recovering, um, growing, uh, it's, it's pretty much, you know, anyone who wants to lose weight, it's pretty much every single human there is. Um, and I'm not the only one who's saying this. This was a New York Times article saying anyone over 40 needs double the RDA of protein. So this is starting to make it into the mainstream that actually protein is a good thing, um, quite protective. What are we eating more of? So our red meat consumption has actually gone way down since 1970. Look at our poultry intake, it's gone way, way up. Uh, guess what, poultry is really high in omega-6 and not as nutrient dense as beef. Salad and cooking oils, and that's not olive oil. Grains, and that's not pearl barley. And caloric sweeteners, and that's not honey, right? Um, so we're eating a lot more processed food and a lot less nutrient dense food. And when we're going to the grocery store, this is 1982 versus 2012, we can see that we're spending less on meats, even though we're complaining so much about how meat is so expensive, uh, but yet we're spending twice as much on processed food and sweets. Okay, now I'm gonna get into the environmental stuff. So soil is our life. And um, there was an expert from the United Nations that uh, made this quite shocking quote that we only have about 60 years left of farming if the soil degradation continues. So our current agriculture system is completely failing and we really do need to do something about this. Um, but the future is not crunchy water grown 100% indoors under artificial light in plastic trays. Okay, where I went to get my graduate degree in nutrition um, right outside of, uh, of the building on Louis Pasteur Boulevard um, were all these freight farms. So in Boston, that's, that's the company, and it's like $50,000 to buy in to be able to grow lettuce locally with all these external inputs. So we have to look at the whole picture and, um, and see, like, is this really making sense, and what are we getting nu nutri nutritionally out of this process? Um, so, I mean, lettuce is fine. I have no problem with people eating lettuce, but this is not going to be the future of our food. It's highly expensive process. They don't even take the tops off these buildings to, like, maybe let sunlight in. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through a thought experiment here. Um, and this is Rob and I came up with this for our book, which um, is actually being published by the publisher of the China Study and will be out next year. Um, so imagine that there is another planet that is uh, similar to Earth, and it's totally barren, and you want to create a self-sustaining food ecosystem there. So you want this to be, you know, resource light. You don't want to have to be, you know, trucking all these resources from the from Earth onto this new planet. So you want it to be like, you know, able to be a, a, a healthy ecosystem on its own. So the first thing you do is plant grass, okay? But then you come back and um, a year later and all the grass is dead. Does anyone know why the grass died? 
some of you have been in my presentations and you know paleo FX. So you need you need some inputs and you need some stimulation on that grass in order to help it grow. And so you could use some miracle grow or some other fossil fuel chemicals, or you could maybe find something that's a self-replicating bioreactor that can actually convert this grass into more uh, nutrition for the soil um, while stimulating it to grow. So you come back and plunk some cows in there and now you've got cow, uh, grass cow world, okay? But then you come back a few years later and you find this again. So what was missing from this scenario? What happened? What happened was nothing was keeping those cows in check and so they ate all the grass. The cows died, the grass died. I'm going through this really quickly, I'm sorry. I have a lot of slides. Um, so the next thing you do is try to keep the cows in check, okay? And so you introduce some wolves. Now you've got sort of this dynamic equilibrium. The wolves are keeping the cows in check. They're also keeping the cows from overgrazing certain parts of the grasses. And so the cows are constantly on the move because they don't want to be sort of sitting ducks. You know, they want to be constantly moving away from the predators that are hiding out. And um, this also is really healthy for the land because it's allowing the grass that was just grazed a good time to rest. And in that rest period is when the magic happens with the carbon sequestration and the regeneration and um, soil building. But it's still very fragile because what if one thing happens, you know, a virus comes and attacks the wolves or, you know, something ha some fungus takes over the grass, you're, you're still in trouble again. So the idea I'm trying to illustrate here is that we want complexity, we want resilience, we want biodiversity, we want this silly diagram of as much life as possible because when you have multiple different types of grazing animals and other animals in the system, once you have different types of predators, if one thing happens you know, to the wolves, you've got another predator that can take over. Um, and so you want the world to be pulsing with life which is the exact opposite of what Beyond Burger is doing with monocropping. And this is how nature works. Again, this is an African uh, e example, um, but it's the same thing that I was mentioning with the wolves and the cattle, where um, you know these guys need to bunch together really tightly, they need to eat as quickly as they can, and they need to get off that and move, or else they're just gonna get gobbled up, right? So uh, we don't have to rewild everything and just allow uh, the wolves to eat this nutrient-dense food. We can actually mimic this type of situation with cattle through mob grazing or um, there's many other terms for you know, this, this general theory of bunching the animals and moving them um, on a consistent basis. So we've got holistic management, um, adaptive multi-paddock, grazing so I'm kind of a fan of the whole range of the idea that we just need to keep things moving what we don't want is anything stagnant that's not how nature works so humans can be the ones that are moving things along with electric fencing sometimes multiple times a day um, I've been filming with lots of ranchers that are doing this three times a day so it's a lot more work and a lot of farmers think this is like crazy hippie stuff and they don't you know, uh, typically your grass-fed beef is just open, open the paddock uh, in the beginning of the string, spring and just let them out. That's how it's happening uh, when I was in Iceland. That's, that's kind of how it is. Like, they just let the sheep out. Um, if they're not managed properly, they're actually going to do more harm than good because they're going to be overgrazing their favorite uh, grasses and forbs and things, killing them allowing the more undesirable, less nutrient-dense foods to be coming up um, and basically increasing desertification and degrading soil health. So we absolutely have to have this type of management for, um, for soil health and for the animal health too because if one animal here has a parasite load and they're all grazing the same little patch day in and day out all summer long, 
those parasites are going to get spread to every single one of those animals. If they're moving constantly, the birds are going to follow right behind. So a, a lot of the filming that I've done, when we move the cattle, those birds swoop what, right in to pick out all the parasites out of the manure, and then that animal can just fight off those parasites naturally. But unfortunately, what we've done is we've created grass world with our global monoculture situation. And um, as far as lab meat goes, again, it, it, we have to consider all of the inputs. Where are they getting the, the sugars to grow this meat from? It's just pick a monocrop. So wheat, corn, soy, you can't make something out of nothing. Um, so that's, again, that's how all these fake foods are being made. It's just basically a global monoculture. So the next question I get is, how are you going to feed the world this way? This is really nice, but this is ridiculous. So the first thing I'll say to that is that not all land can be cropped. So um, where Meatless Mondays likes to say that 75% of the Earth's agricultural land is taken over by animals, what they're not giving you context for in this lovely pictorial graphic here is that most of the world's agricultural land is only suited to grazing animals, not to cropping. So if you picture basically anywhere else than the, Ameri uh, than the United States, right? Like I'm going to be filming pretty soon in um, the Chihuahua Desert in Mexico where they're regenerating a million acres of desert with cattle. You can't till up that land and grow corn and soy, okay? There's, there's water issues. There's mo most of the Earth's surface is either too hilly, too rocky. The soil is too poor. Um, they don't have access to sustainable irrigation. Um, and so grazing animals really do need to be on about 70% of our agricultural land. And this is an image from the Savory Institute of before and after and just the powerful uh, effects that this type of management can have. So when we stop thinking about um, growing food in a reductionist way and start thinking about it in a more holistic way, um, we're actually able to increase the wildlife here, um, grow healthier food, and um, heal the land. And to me, this is where it makes so much sense to those of us who already have this sort of ancestral framework because we already are trying to kind of look at how humans evolved and what diet makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. This is just the food production version of a paleo type diet, right? Um, this over-focus on emissions is really frustrating to me. This is um, a graph from the EPA, and this is just typical beef. Um, so as a clinician, I actually just want people to start eating meat. Um, and, and even typical livestock is only 3.9% of the US uh, greenhouse gas emission burden. Um, and so, Reducing, reducing all animal agriculture then um, really just doesn't make a huge dent and will hurt us nutritionally. And then of course grass-fed beef, which is um, the gold standard uh, well-managed grass-fed beef like at White Oak Pastures, you would actually have to eat one burger for every impossible burger you ate in order to offset your emissions from your impossible burger consumption. This is a study that came out, um, and I've got the citation right here. Okay, what about the water? So when they say that it takes, um, you know, all this water, here's the, here's the meatless Mondays. It takes, uh, there you have another meme that it's uh, 10 bathtubs full of water for your quarter pound burger. What they're not showing you is that most of that water is considered green water. So there's different methodologies at looking at water. Green water is rain that falls anyway. So what we need to really be looking at is what is the blue water footprint of a particular food. Blue water is groundwater, you know, ir uh, irrigation, things like that. And then the gray water is the water used in waste. So as you can see, typical beef is 94% green water, 4% blue water, and 3% green water. 
grass-fed beef is 97% green water and 3% blue water. And cows urinate too. Okay, but isn't it so inefficient to feed all this stuff to cows? Can't we just be eating the grains ourselves and not feeding it to animals? So this is another frustration that I have. Um, so even in typical beef production, so this isn't grass-fed beef, but even in typical beef production, the majority of what these animals are eating is non-edible by humans. So all cows start out on grass. The ones that end up in a feedlot, which is the majority of cattle in the United States, but most of their diet, if you look over their whole lifespan, is not grain as opposed to CAFO chicken and CAFO pork, which is 100% indoors and 100% grain because they're monogastrics. Um, these cattle are actually upcycling nutrients, nutrient poor foods. So a lot of what they're eating is actually crop residue like corn stalks from the ethanol industry. Um, distilled uh, uh, distillers grains from the alcohol industry. That all gets reused, run through a cow, and turned into protein. So if we didn't feed that stuff to cattle, it would just decompose and emit greenhouse gases. I would rather see it run through a cow and turned into nutrient-dense protein for humans. So actually, cattle are one of the most efficient animals at you know, grazing on land we can't use for crops, eating food we can't digest ourselves, and turning it into the most digestible, most uh, nutrient-dense food possible to humans. So again, nature works in systems, and we have to look at things in the whole. So it really disturbs me. There was a film called um, Before the Flood that Leon Leonardo DiCaprio um, aired on National Geographic, and he's standing with um, an environmental expert, Gideon Eschel, I've gotten into many arguments with. Um, and they're standing in front of a cow grazing on some grass. And Gidden says to Leonardo, if everyone would just switch from beef to chicken, it would be a much healthier food system. So first of all, beef is about 30% more nutrient dense than chicken meat. And it doesn't have all those omega-6s. It has some omega-6s, but not nearly as much omega-6s as, as poultry does. Um, from an animal welfare perspective, these chickens are 100% in this barn for their entire life. And there's no way, if you don't slaughter these chickens by five weeks, they're going to die of a heart attack anyway. So I've, I've raised chickens before. Um, and they're eating 100% grain. So they're directly competing with humans for agricultural land that we could be growing food on. So I think chicken is actually... You know, e even if your choice is in a grocery store and five minutes, okay. Um, if you're in a grocery store and your choice is chicken or typical beef, I would still argue typical beef is going to be better nutritionally, environmentally, and ethically because one cow can provide almost 500 pounds of food. How many chickens would you need to kill for that? And there's no humane slaughter rules for poultry. So there's that. Uh, and then from a perspective of least harm, when you look at the number of animals that die for a typical, you know, eat lancet type diet that's very low in animal protein and very high in um, grains and industrial seed oils, um, and the number of critters that are annihilated when we have to turn a field into, or a pasture or a forest into um, a monocrop, you know, we have to annihilate everything above and below ground in order to get that nice and flat so that we can then run the tractors uh, through to plant. And then we're spraying uh, everything to make sure that there's no extra life that comes on. Uh, and then, you know, after harvest, we have to fumigate all those rats so that they're not going to eat all the grain that goes into our bread. Um, so when you compare all of those lives to one grass-fed cow that's actually improving ecosystem function um, and uh, increasing biodiversity then could provide 500 pounds of meat. Um, the choice is really clear that, f uh, that the diet of least harm actually must include large ruminant animals. 
But the problem is anything even remotely close to death is completely taboo in our culture and we don't want to talk about it. So we farm out our old people, we send them to nursing homes, we don't want to deal with death, we don't want to think about our own death or, or anything um, to do with death, and certainly we can't kill a cuddly sheep. So that's part of the problem. So the urbanization of, of humans has really led to this horrible disconnectedness to our barbaric, primal um, nature as animals. And less than half of the U.S. won't even admit that they're going to die, period. So, I mean, even in the ancestral health world, uh, there's a lot of people, like, overly consumed, I think, with longevity um, instead of looking at just quality of life, right? Like, I would rather just go out with a bang, having fun, and feeling really great than living to 110. And that's another reason why I actually get really irritated when people say, oh, but, you know, less protein is, you know, good for longevity. It's like, okay, if you want sarcopenia and you just want to be, like, wheeled around for the last 30 years of your life, maybe, you know, but if you want to be strong and vibrant, then eat protein from animals. Better meat is not elitist. Um, I did a blog post where I actually looked at the price per ounce of all these foods, and organic grass-fed beef was less expensive per ounce, and I wasn't even looking at per ounce of protein or per, per nutrient. I was just looking at per ounce. And then I went to Walmart and looked at the price per pound of organic grass-fed beef. Um, I, as a you know, local farmer, I do recommend trying to connect with a local farmer to get your meat, but you know, when people tell me that I'm being elitist and that it's not accessible to everybody, I get it. Not everyone can have a chest freezer and put up all that money to buy half a cow at once, which is fine. So organic grass-fed beef from Walmart is certainly a fine option for those folks. And um, Beyond Burger is actually twice as expensive per pound. It's just that their package price, see, for um, they're selling it by the half pound. So there's an illusion here, but the package is larger. So this is one pound for 5.98, half a pound for 4.84. And look at those ingredients. So one of the researchers I'm working with for the film is actually doing a nutrient anal a micronutrient analysis on um, Impossible and Beyond Burger, and so I'm excited to um, really have that data because when you go into Chronometer right now, it's not the full set of data on micronutrients of these foods. Okay, so uh, more information about my film is at sacredcow.info. I did create this. Um, this is a double-sided flyer, 11 by 17, or I have a very large poster. This is my last slide. One minute. It's perfect. Um, and so all, these are all uh, the main talking points, uh, nutritionally and environmentally. There's, a, there's another side to this. Uh, and, and I have citations for all of my claims on here. Um, again, the book is coming out. We're actually launching it at Polyface Farm next summer on July 14th, um, and the film will be out just before that too. So I'm, I'm killing myself trying to get this film done. Um, we're about to move into post-production. I'm really, really excited about that. And um, I've already been invited all over Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, Chile, um, I'm going to present on this in Uruguay next month. Um, people are really, really ready for this, and I have um, really, really credible experts. I've, I've got the United Nations, so there's this other, you know, media thing going on right now with the United Nations report is telling everybody that we have to eat vegan or we're all going to blow up and die, and it's not what the report says. Um, I do have experts from the United Nations talking about the importance of sustainable livestock production to especially developing countries, and um, I'm going to have even more of them next month at this um, global meeting that I'm going to be going to and filming experts from all over the world at. So, thank you. <laughs>Hi, hey, thank you, Diana. Yeah. Um, I'm your belated session chair, so okay. <laughs> we we have a couple of extra minutes because the uh, intro session ran late, so we have a uh, 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 full the full amount of time, which is uh, ten minutes for questions. So no worries, so I'll get your questions in. 
uh, I'll just give myself the first question because I'm session chair. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that it, it, the statistic for uh, ta taking meat out of uh, the diet of every American is uh, approximately 2.6% in terms of GHG uh, emissions. So uh, I thought one thing that might be interesting is to look at what are the uh, emissions that you can possibly reduce by taking yourself out of that, uh, the medical industrial complex by having adequate protein? Yeah, so I, I there aren't any um, statistics looking at that on a big population perspective, uh, perspective, but I did find some greenhouse gas footprint, eco footprint of these, um, you know, dialysis, all the plastics involved in that. I mean, so I, I did look at some of the data. I mean, this is a huge undertaking because I'm, I'm, I have to break down the China study. I have to, I have to respond to every single one of these, uh, you know, without making a book that big or a film that's 20 hours long. Um, so, uh, so I look forward to more information and more uh, people coming out of their silos and putting all of these ideas together. Like if we're gonna you know, try to save the planet, we need healthy people at the same time, so how do we do that balance? Hey. Hey, um, excellent as usual. Um, as you probably remember, I'm a, a faculty in pediatrics at the University of Washington, which makes me associated with Seattle Children's, one of the best children's hospitals in the world, and one of the biggest. Um, we have a bit of a problem uh, in that we have a CEO who thinks we should be serving less meat, um, luckily just in the cafeterias rather than to the kids. Um, but there is a big drive to improve uh, the environmental impact or reduce the environmental impact of the hospital, which is huge. Um, and so I've been sending them a lot of the data that you showed are very similar to say, hey, if you switched all your beef to grass-fed beef, you could basically make your meat carbon neutral um, and like mine's blown everywhere, obviously. Yeah. However, when I speak to the, the head of nutrition, which I will do very soon, who's in charge of buying this meat, when she turns around and says, where do I get beef for thousands of people a day? that's raised this way, do you have any, uh, like, do you have tips about, rather than doing this on an individual scale, how do we do it on a large scale that I say, yeah. this is where you go and, and find that beef? Yes, I'd love to connect you to Verde Farms. They're actually located in Massachusetts and, um, and they're the largest supplier of grass-fed beef in the United States to Walmart and Costco. Um, so they might have some ideas, so I can make introductions for you. Awesome. Um, I actually sat through a presentation from Healthcare Without Harm and I was shaking, like where their lead dietitian was bragging about how they've reduced um, meat to patients by 68%. She's bragging about this. And I, so I, I didn't say anything in the middle of the presentation because I, I knew that was going to be like triggering. But I did go up to her after, which was still triggering to her. And, um, <laughs> And set, you know, protein requirements actually go way up when people are in hospitals. So how how can you justify this? Like, um, so I, there's this huge disconnect between, um, you know, and and I've been labeled as you know right wing for saying that eating meat is healthy. Like it's a very political. <laughs> um, it it shouldn't be, but um, it, you're either a, a less meat environmentalist. Or you eat meat and you don't care about the environment. And there's there's no, uh, people can't, you know, when I go to these grass-fed beef meetings, it's all less meat, less meat, less meat. Less meat, better meat. And so when I say more meat, better meat, <laughs> that like totally stresses them out and, and has made it so that I actually have not gotten a ton of funding from them because they, it's, that's not a message they want to hear. Great information, particularly uh, on the health side uh, and on the environmental side. One, one argument you sometimes hear is that if people were to shift to a, a more meat-intense diet, there wouldn't be enough land to sustain the world's population. Have yep. you done an analysis yes. looking at that and, and showing? We totally have the land. Yeah. I have it in my book. And, and sort of by country and globally, it could sustain the same population or more than an aggregate agrarian basis. I have economy. US numbers on that. I don't have any global numbers. Um, I mean, we're there's so many of us because of fossil fuels. I am answering so many questions right now that it's it's really hard to then 
be the only person that's out there. Like I'm a dietitian and a farmer, right? Mm -hmm. um, to to then extrapolate all of this and do all these calculations for the world. Um, what I can tell you is that there's too many of us. Do we want lots of people fed like crap, or do we want healthy people? And our current system is completely failing and producing sick people and killing our environment. And so regenerative agriculture is actually the only solution we have moving forward. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's too many people. But that's not within my scope as a farmer to, I mean, I, I can only talk about best practices and I can only talk about, uh, you know, what diet it, I believe is, is the most uh, nutrient dense. Yeah. Hi, so now regarding nutrition, I, it's apparently said in some regulatory body that the vegan diet is healthy for all ages. Yeah. And yet I see lots of evidence that infants and babies don't do well on plants only. Yep. Can you Yeah, I'm actually going to gonna be presenting more, in, right. in January to the Dietary Guidelines Committee about why I think that if a parent wants to feed their child a vegan diet, they need to go through an education program, signing off that if there's any evidence of failure to thrive or malnutrition, that they will start feeding their children a species-appropriate diet, and that they need to be um, visiting a pediatrician on a much more regular basis than once a year, so something like you know every other month, in order to monitor for any signs of failure to thrive. Okay, and then part B of that is, do you know anything, apparently there were four people that were able to vote on that resolution, and they were vegetarians, but they so didn't the disclose. The three authors of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics position paper were all, um, one of them works for a physician's committee for responsible medicine. One of them's a Seventh-day Adventist, and the other one has, and they all have uh, vegetarian and vegan cookbooks for sale, but they declared no conflict They did of not declare any, I remember that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yep. Hi, Diana. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, my question is, um, I'm looking for practical advice. So I work as a trainer. I coach people to get in the best shape and the best health of their life. Um, could you maybe um, uh, give me advice that I could give to a client on how they could eat as healthy as possible and procure specifically like the healthiest quality of meat possible? So I always try to get people to fix their health before they worry about sustainability. Um, and I just think it's just can feel really overwhelming. Like I couldn't find a grass fed steak, so I ate a bagel, you know? Um, and so I would go with, um, I, I really like what Marty Kendall is doing with the nutrient dense uh, protein sparing modified fast uh, as sort of a really great template for, um, you know, looking at nutrient density plus jacking up the protein and just focusing on nutrient density, which you kind of can't argue people, uh, just tracking things in chronometer, jack up their protein, you know, set, set their uh, macros and then have them look at, you know, their zinc and copper and all of that kind of stuff and see, you know, what foods they gravitate towards or Marty has a, a really nice um, nutrient optimizer like website you can go to. Um, I happened, I'm not a super competitive person, but when I did that challenge, I like had to be the most nutrient densest, like I had to beat Rhonda Patrick, you know, like I was like, um, and it was super fun for me as a nutrition geek to do it. So you might enjoy it as well. Um, and then uh, once they're kind of used to eating, you know, after 30, 60 days, they're kind of used to eating just more meat and colorful vegetables. Then you can talk about, well, you know, you might want to find a half cow from a grass-fed beef farmer that's near you. Um, Eatwild.com is a really great resource to, um, you know, partner up and find farmers that do good practices. Great. Thank you. Yep. All right. Another round of applause for the fabulous Dan Rogers. Thank you.